guys, content marketing is dominating the industrial space right now. In the next 90 minutes, you'll learn everything you need to know for your manufacturing and industrial company and how to take your content to the next level. Running a YouTube channel is not as simple as just uploading videos. In this video, I'm gonna show you the secrets on how we do it for our channel and for our industrial clients. What's up guys, I'm Kyle Milan. We're back with another episode of the show talking about industrial marketing. I'm still a little sick, so don't mind me if I start coughing and take a swig of my drink. So today's topic, setting up your YouTube channel for industrial videos. How many people out there have a YouTube channel currently for your company site or maybe even for your personal site? If you do, put something down in the comments saying, I've got one. And, and there might be some things in here where we want to go back and forth to talk about optimization. The purpose of videos is to increase engagement, tell your story faster, et cetera, et cetera, right? Videos have been popping off for multiple years. Everybody's been saying that this is how you get engagement. It 100% works. That's why we have a big video team here at MFG Tribe. That's why we produce over 1,500 videos a year for our customers because it just works. Let's talk about how are we going to take it to that next level. Number one, let's go to the board. You know that AI has been making a lot of changes. However, so has our friends at Google. And what they've been doing is, here's the situation. We, we track this with uh, our competitors. In industrial marketing, we track this with our customers' competitors. And because of AI, everybody's writing articles. The issue is, is that most of them are AI generated. So Google knows that. What they've done is said, look, people are going to create a lot of written content because of AI. I mean, we looked at a couple of our competitors that are writing an article a week, some of them an article every two days. We grab their content, we throw them into one of our scanners that we pay for, and it's coming back 99% AI-generated content. Well, Google's not dumb, and they know that, but they know that they don't wanna have to check everything all the time before they post it into search results. So what they've done with Gemini, which is their software, just like a chat GPT, uh, you have to pay for it. I think it's like 20 bucks a month, 30 bucks a month. The purpose that what Google's trying to do is say, you type in a search and Gemini is going to give you the answer within that search results before it serves up organic uh, answers, right? So it's, what's the best recipe for X, Y, and Z? Gemini will give you the answer, kind of like how ChatGPT tries to do it now. The difference is that Gemini can process like a million more lines of information than ChatGPT can. And so since Google knows that people are just posting up AI generated content, doesn't wanna to have to scan everything, they're placing more value on videos and they're they've already started doing this months ago and they're pushing video search results and the importance of videos to the top because videos like this one where it's a person talking are harder to dupe when it comes to an AI standpoint. Now we can do it. We have software to do it to where we can have, we have two programs where we can, it learns my voice and then we can type in anything and it will sound exactly like my voice. It just has to learn my voice for with about 10 minutes worth of video content, which obviously we have probably 10,000 hours worth of video content right now. So we can do it. And then even AI that can make the mouth move and things like that. You can also do that with AI, but it's, it's less readily available. Less people are using it because it does look somewhat wonky. So since Google knows that they're like videos that are created, are harder to duplicate. It's actual person saying it. It's not some computer saying it. So we want to push these higher up. So if you haven't started getting into video, I don't know what more you need from me to tell you to do it. Besides, it's going to increase engagement. It's going to increase your brand awareness. It's going to drive attention and traffic. It's going to make you stand out from your competition. Because if you look at even our customers versus our competitors, uh, we create video content for them a lot of it every year and their competitors still are like maybe one or two videos while we've created like 92 in six months or eight months. Um, so it's a way to stand out. So those four reasons, plus now Google has said video content is more important 
then written in organic search results because of this AI being able to dupe people. So that's point number one, is that Google is telling you, this is a change that we're making. And like I said, we've seen it. We've seen it with our content. We've seen it with our clients' content. If you set up these videos correctly and do them consistently to show you're a subject matter expert and have your YouTube channel set up good and customized, then this is how you're gonna get attention. Keep in mind also that YouTube is the second largest search engine in the world, second only to Google, and Google owns YouTube. So what do you think that they're gonna do from a prioritization of search results, right? Of course, they're gonna put video above something like Facebook posts, right? They don't own Facebook. Number two is you wanna focus on your titles, your descriptions, and your thumbnails. Those, those are the, the three areas. One, two, three. Titles, descriptions, thumbnails. The reason why you want to do that, your title has to be good enough, just like the title of, of this live, right? Setting up your YouTube channel for industrial videos. The purpose is anybody that's thinking about industrial videos, currently creating industrial videos, I'm trying to hook you to get some information from us that we've done at scale and learn what works and what doesn't. So you've got to make that, that title somewhat hooky, is what we call it, to where it's like, Three ways to improve your part design for plastics. That's a good title with a good hook, right? Learn how we increase our efficiency by 26% in 60 days. That's a good type of hook, but you wanna be able to have that title optimized and use as many characters as you can within the allowance of it. Like you're probably talking about 100 and, I don't know, probably like 100, 120 characters out there. Um, your description should be should be indexed with chapters, right? Google made that, or YouTube made that clear months ago, probably like 12 months ago, that they want to see chapters. So you're like, chapter one is this, timestamp, et cetera, makes it easy for people to click through. If it's easy for people to click through, then, then YouTube's gonna promote it more, et cetera, et cetera. But your description should not just be like a sentence. You should use at least 300 words, 400 words to it. You should have links to other areas, links to your website, links to your social channel, links to uh, a form for people to fill out built in that, and you can customize that in your settings in YouTube. If you go into the settings on default upload, <coughs> you can make it to where your upload default already has this information in it, all of your social links and stuff like that, and then you're just writing copy uh, over the top, also with your tags, your default tags. So you can set that up to where every video upload, it does that same thing and then you just write the copy. But your description has to have chapters and it should be descriptive of the video to help Google understand it and then index it. And the third thing is gonna be thumbnails. You don't want your thumbnails, you wanna put a custom thumbnail on there. You wanna have either your team created or if you're working with an agency like ours, we manage all of our clients' YouTube channels, we do all the customization, uploading schedule, copy, graphics, video production, editing, everything. Um, cause our goal is to get them more views. So we want to be able to control as much of that process as possible. But with the thumbnails, you want to try and have them different. Don't have them be the same static thing. If you can put a person on a thumbnail, it's going to draw more attention than if it's just words. Um, but you gotta have, you don't want to stick with the same type of thumbnail setup. I made that mistake years ago. We had kind of like a template where it's like a picture of me, black and red bars, and then you're just changing out the words. <coughs> um, that did not work well. So you want each thumbnail to be different if possible. The third area. So the website, you want to embed all of your video content onto your website if possible. Have it as a blog post. Um, you can do whatever you want, but you need to have embed the videos on your website. Well, my homepage, my about us page, this product or service page that we have has a space here where I can embed a video make a video specifically for that page and embed it there. The reason why you wanna do this is two reasons. Number one, if it's embedded, the plays are gonna to count towards your YouTube plays natively. Number two, you've already got traffic going to your website every single month, so may as well capitalize on that and get them to view a video of yours, something new you created, and, may, and it could be something where they weren't engaging with you before, but now that they've seen this video, they're like, oh dude, I wanna engage with that. Um, that's where, that's where you want to try and put it on the website if possible, wherever you can. But at a minimum, having a resources area and be able to post this stuff up there, super important. But utilize the traffic. You're already getting attention to the website. Post those videos up there, even if they're short form content, which we're going to get into next. Number four, 
YouTube Shorts. Um, you're talking like 15 seconds to 60 seconds long. They came out and made a priority on this in January of last year, 23. Uh, they, they started talking about in 20, end of 22, but they said basically they're trying to take attention away from TikTok, Instagram Reels, etc. cetera, put a, put a bigger priority on shorts showing up in people's feeds. Not so much from a search standpoint, but within the feed, in-app content, et cetera. They started making that change in January of last year. They made it pretty quickly. And what's cool about shorts is that all you do is upload video format in vertical. You can put some captions on it and you just put hashtag shorts in the description and that automatically puts it into shorts. You can get two, three, 4,000 views in like a day on shorts, right? Versus like a long form video may take you a couple months, a couple years to get that many, depending on what the subject is. But you have to look at it and say, all right, I'm creating a long form video that's five minutes long, 10 minutes long. In here we say, what do we say guys? For every minute of finished footage you can get a short from, right? What's like a what's like a general rule of thumb, Riley? 10 minute video, what can we get? Eight shorts? Probably like eight to 10. So eight to 10 shorts on a 10 minute video. So that's one video that's 10 minutes long and then eight to 10 more shorts. So you're talking about, you're talking about nine to 11 videos you can create from one shooting. Just like this live will be a live, a long form video, and then how many shorts do you think you'll generate from this? Um, 10, to 15, 10 to 15 shorts from it, right? So posting the shorts show up in the feed, get higher views, etc. They go to your channel. That's not stuff that you want to post on your website, but that's stuff that you post onto social. If you guys have been watching my content, all of our shorts come from long form videos unless I physically shoot the short with my camera on my phone and then post it that way. But the the shorts is so important to get exposure and just create short micro form of content. But that's the stuff that you want to share on the social. And because you can get so many videos from a single long form video, you can put one to two a week on LinkedIn. That's how we do it for our clients. And that just works. Channel custom ization. Customizing your channel. So, so if you're an admin for the YouTube channel, there's there's two different experiences that people get. If they're a subscriber, the first thing that they see when they come to your site, you can customize what video they see if they're already a subscriber versus if they're not a subscriber. But you need to have some sort of video that shows up. But you can change it starting there. Upper headline, background image, links, logo, Profile pick, whatever it is, customize all that stuff. Also with your playlist, people like to view playlists. Like that's something that if they get into a subject, they want to just go down that rabbit hole and play after play. So creating custom playlists and grabbing videos from your library and throwing them in there. Look at my YouTube channel, how we set it up. We've done it for clients too, where if it's like a series about this technology, this product, this industry, right? If you can have playlists based on industry, you can have playlists based on verticals that you're serving. You can have playlists based on technology. If you're a machine shop or something like that, CNC milling videos, lathe videos, Swiss screw machine video, like you can have like gear cutting videos. You can have playlists all under that. So that when somebody does see it, they can be like, ooh, I wanna watch more of that. That's the best way to do it, setting up those playlists. The only way to do that is to customize your channel. If you guys are in industrial marketing, you've been struggling with what is your strategy for paid advertising? Does it actually work in my industry and for my company? Then on this episode, I'm going to break down the traditional and common ways that people have been doing it and where you should focus your attention. Gladiator in this auto war. What you think that I've been fighting for? Got a cape on like a superhero. They rushing at me like a matador. Nah, nah, I don't need your energy. I don't need the negativity. I'm just trying to bring my people up. Promise y'all I got the remedy. Straight to the roof. Tell them we bringing the troops. We got a little surprise. You thinking that we the truth. We give it 120. We never make an excuse. So go run and tell everybody down that we coming for you. So let's jump right into it. What is the purpose of paid advertising, right? What's the main purpose uh, for you marketers out there? You may think like, oh, it's it's so that way you know we can we can get to the top of things, so we can get more traffic, so we can get more leads, things like that. But if you break it down, the main purpose of advertising is simply speed, 
you simply want to do something faster. So you're doing things, they're not working as well as you'd hope that they'd work. They're not moving quick enough. So you're like, you know what, screw it. I'm going to throw some dollars at it. I'm going to run some paid ads and get that traffic in as fast as possible, which is great. And I, and I 100% agree with you. Paid advertising, the focus behind it is the speed. But let's look at like the common methods that that people have been doing paid advertising in industrial. The first one's going to be trade shows. So you've spent, what do you got, 10 by 10 booth or 100 by 100 booth? You spent five to $100,000 to go to a trade show, right? So that's a form of paid advertising. Um, but really what I, what I want to look at is once you say, I'm going to this trade show, then the trade show is going to be like, Dude, you guys need to you guys need to advertise with us. You need a front page ad. You need a full page ad in the show program. You need uh, pre show marketing campaigns. We want to put you at the bottom of our email list and our distribution and banners outside and all that stuff. But does it actually work? In my experience, in the last six years of owning MFG Tribe, the industrial marketing agency, and even before that, when I was directly in your guys's shoes doing what you do. Um, I've never really seen it work all that well. Now, do trade shows work? Yes, to a certain degree, right? If you're really bullish against trade shows and you really monitor exactly dollar for dollar that you've spent, can you say it was worth it? A lot of times, yes, uh, if you're doing one or two trade shows, but people are doing six, eight, 10 trade shows, it's usually not worth it. Where, where the trade show wants to make money is they got you on the booth and they got you at the show. Uh, where they want to make their money is on that, additional things. So, so it's like the upsell opportunities. Um, when people get a show program, what do they typically do with it? Are they flipping through the show program saying, Oh, who do I want to visit at this show? Who's at the show? No, they're not. They've already got their plan. They know who they're going to see. If there's somebody specific, they know who's going to be there. They've gotten emails ahead of time. Um, they've looked at the exhibitor list. They know where people are. They look at the map and that's pretty much all that people are interested in when they're going to a trade shows. And then they walk the show. They're not flipping through the show program saying, oh, look at this nice full page ad that that company probably spent $3,500 on to be in the show program. Um, I'm going to go and visit them because I had no idea who they are, what they do, but now they've piqued my interest and I want to go and visit them. That usually does not happen. It's a complete, in my opinion, waste of money to spend money on that. When you are going to a trade show, the way the area to spend the money on is going to be the list of attendees and going after specific people and saying, I want to purchase this list from you of 2000 people, a thousand people, 500 people. I want to purchase a list of their contact name, title, uh, where they work at, what's their email address and phone number if possible. And then usually they say, what are they interested in at this trade show? And then check those boxes. You want to pay for something like that. And that will be a lot cheaper than going after a show program ad spot. So the next common thing that we're going to look at is media purchasing. So media from the standpoint, traditional industrial marketing, manufacturing marketing guys, when I talk about media, they're talking about magazines. Okay. Same thing with the trade show programs. You cannot quantify. I don't care if uh, ABC machining publication says we've got 75,000 engineers that subscribe to our physical print magazine every single month or quarter, or how often they print it. But can they quantify that and say, you just spent $10,000 to be it, to have an ad space or $5,000 to have an ad space on that print magazine. Can they tell you how many people actually look at it? They can't. They can say that it went out to this many people. This is how many people received it. This is how many people are on our list, but they can't tell you how many people looked at your stuff. Then they go digital, right? So a lot of these media typical companies, the, the, uh, magazines, stuff like that are like, no, no, we have a digital version now. So we can tell you, yeah, but can they tell you who it was? They can't, they can tell you, oh, well, we think it's this person from this company. They clicked an email or something like that, but they, they, all they can say is maybe if they saw what it was that you were in, in that magazine, but are they tracking that to your website? Are they tracking clicks? Are you then looking at these people came from this referral source to my website? And then once they hit my website, they looked at this many pages, spent this much time on their site. Usually not. Usually you guys aren't looking at it. And usually the publication company is not providing you with that. It's just all fluffy numbers and, and big KPIs of like, we're going to send it to 75,000 people. And then unfortunately, the industrial companies sit there and like, oh my God, my stuff got seen by 65,000 people, which is just not true. So that's another common, common area. So we got trade shows and we got media publications. The last one is going to be Google. 
Okay. Google advertising. So you've got search, Google search, and then you've got display. Display is like retargeting and images that show up in ad space on other websites that you visit. And Google search can be very beneficial. Uh, that is probably the only area that I would say that most companies spend money on advertising when they first talk to us from a, you know, from a discovery call, they're like, Hey, we spend 2,500 bucks, 5,500 bucks a month on Google ads. Um, I'd say that most of the time that's a smart place to be, but usually their budget is way overkill. Um, and that's simply because they are, they are taking the advice of the advertising company. A lot of times agencies charge a flat fee to manage it. And it's based on a certain dollar range that they spend a month. So if you're spending between a thousand to five thousand dollars a month on advertising, most of the time, um, those advertising agencies are like, all right, we're going to charge you seven hundred and fifty bucks a month or a thousand bucks a month to to create, manage, and optimize those ads and report on them. Um, and then they want you to spend more money because the more money that you spend, the more dollars they can charge you to manage it. Whereas here at MFG Tribe, we're the exact opposite. What you have to understand about Google ads is Google ads is not a linear curve uh, in regards to the dollars that you spend and the performance that you get. It is a bell curve. So it goes up, it peaks and it comes down. The, the key part of optimization is finding where at the top of that bell curve is the best place for you're spending the least amount of dollar and getting the most amount of results. Right. And so what we do when we take on a new client, we typically drop the budget down significantly, sometimes 50 percent, and then creep back up to find that bell curve. Um, and usually it's 20, 30, 40 percent cheaper than what they were paying a month with their their other agency, because at the end of the day, we don't want to spend dollars if you don't have to. And so Google ads and display uh, and retargeting marketing can work for advertising dollars. But for most companies in the let's say 20 million to 200, 300 million a year in revenue um, are typically spending less than I'd say five, $5,000 a month on Google ads. Um, and that's a good kind of top budget to have. I would much rather tell a company to go into Google ads than focus on trade shows or print publications. So those are the three most common that I see. Um, you guys may be saying like, oh, what about social? We'll, we'll get to social. The next thing that I want to talk about is focusing on the organic side. So paid advertising is to take time out of the equation and just go with speed. If you're not currently organically ranking for a search phrase, if you're at page 10 or page 100 or page three of Google and you want to show up first because you want those people that are searching to hit you first, and then you're going to spend money on Google ads. And I totally agree with that to a certain extent. You want to also at the same time, don't just say I'm going to spend money on ads so I don't spend money on organic. You want to focus as much, if not more attention on the organic side of optimizing, optimizing your on-page SEO, focusing on off-page SEO, focusing on making sure that your themes and keywords and phrases that you're going after are a good fit. And then tracking and monitoring that on a weekly, daily, monthly basis is the important part because that's a long-term play. If you want to go after a keyword that has somewhat difficult, let's say medium difficultiness to, to rank high for, you want to start today to get the results in 30, 60, 90 days from now. Um, in this industry, there's like there's not 50,000 people searching a month for what it is that you do for the most part, unless you're in like 3D printing and, and 3D type space, there's higher search volumes. Um, but for the most part, you're looking at less than a couple of thousand searches a month. So you've got a lot of people going after that, um, but most people aren't paying attention to it. They're like, I'm not going to focus on organic. I'm just going to do paid ads, but you got to focus on organic. If not as much, then more to get that ball rolling. We've got tons of videos on the YouTube channel talking about how to optimize for on-page SEO. What are the most important things to look at? Those are great resources. Go over to my channel and check those out to dive deeper into the SEO side. So what is the strategic campaign that I would personally recommend? So I would say first and foremost, you have to be focusing on organic. And guys, just a reminder, leave your comments and questions and things like that in the comment box so that way we can get to them once we're done with this segment and answer anything you guys have, whether it's industrial marketing, sales, technical sales, business, whatever. Um, so the first thing you're going to look at is you want to focus on the organic side with your, your on-page SEO and focus on the organic reach. And organic doesn't just mean Google. Organic also means on social, LinkedIn, posting five days a week on your company page, teaching your employees how to build out and grow their network, 
and pushing the brand out there as much as possible because all that is free. Now, if you're paying an agency like MFG Tribe to do it for you, it's obviously not free, but it's minimal when it comes to compared to the amount of money that you can waste on advertising. So if the base foundation fundamentals are we're, do, we're already doing organic, we're already pushing organic SEO and organic on social, then you're going to want to spend some money on Google from a search standpoint. And what I would do is I would start with like 700 bucks to maybe a thousand dollars and be extremely strategic and bullish against any sort of broad phrase match and broad keyword match. You want to only focus on a very strategic targeted group of people. You want to have things in place with geography restrictions. You do not, the thing with Google search is you don't know the intent behind why the person is searching. So if you don't know why they're searching, you may think, oh, they're searching you know, a machine shop near me because they want to hire a machine shop near me. They're not. They could be doing research. They could be doing competitive stuff. They could be looking to sell you something. There's a million different reasons why somebody could be Google searching something and you don't want to just pigeonhole yourself and say, I know that they are, they're searching for my business. So I want to show up for that all the time because most of the time, the money that you waste on Google search campaigns is far exceeds the money that you're actually spending. That's bringing in quality resources. So you want to do a strategic campaign. Like I said, I'd say no more than a thousand dollars. You can even start with like $200, $300 and be very specific on the phrases and the searches and then also pause those things on weekends so you're not, you know, you may think, oh, it's so many people are doing weekend searches. I would pause those to start with until you can prove it with data to say that the people coming in on the weekend are actually quality things. And so once you start that campaign, you need to look at your Google Analytics, which is tied to your website. And as long as your Google Ads campaign is tied to your Google Analytics account and it's linked, then you can see I spent this much money, this many people clicked it, they came to my website, what percentage of people bounced? Because a lot of times it's like 95%, 92%, 98% of people bounce, which means they came to your website and then left right away. That's just a complete waste of money then. So you want to focus on high quality traffic. You want to below 90%. You want to below 80%. You want to have the click-through rate and the conversion rate over 2 3 4 5% because that means that you're getting the right people. And then you want to talk to your sales team and say, guys, are you getting like, I've seen these leads come through. You talk to them, these good quality leads. Yes, they are. Or no, they're not and then adjust and adapt. So you can definitely do Google search. Retargeting is cheap. Retargeting is basically taking traffic that comes to your site. Once they leave your site, you set up criteria saying they've seen these many pages or they've spent this much time on my website. Then when they go to other websites, they're going to see this graphic of ours or this display ad that says like ABC company, best in the world in this, um, or a logo of your company with a link to your website. They're going to see that on the, the Google search display partner network. And no matter where they go on the internet, there's always spots for ads and they will see that. And that's basically just trying to remind them, hey, you are here, don't forget about us. So it's good to have some sort of retargeting campaign in place. Um, but something like that, you're talking about, unless you have thousands of hits a month uh, to your website, which a lot of you may have, you're talking about maybe a couple hundred dollars a month spent on Google search or sorry, Google display retargeting. So not a huge amount of dollars spent to it. So it's fine to turn it on and see how it works and then turn it back off. The next area is going to be looking at things on social. I've talked about this on so many of our LinkedIn episodes, LinkedIn advertising, specifically the display advertising that shows up when you're sitting on your phone or on your desktop and you're scrolling through your feed every, every like it starts with a second post and then it's like every seven to nine posts from there is a promoted post and it's a display ad. Those things work extremely well because you can control who they go to. So Google search, you don't know the intent behind the people on LinkedIn. They're not searching for you. You're just showing something that's relevant to entice them to click. LinkedIn advertising is better from uh, better than Google from that standpoint, because you can control the creative, you can control where they go to, and you can also control who sees it. Whereas on Google, you're just basically saying, I want to send them to this page of my website because it's relevant. And here's a search phrase. And if somebody searches it and they click it, then they should be, you know, looking to go to that. And a lot of times they're not, they just click back right away. So with LinkedIn, um, you can target even specific companies, a hundred companies, 150 companies, only certain people within those companies, you can get extremely detailed in your search list of who you want to market this to. And because of that, it is expensive. Okay. So something that you're spending 40 cents or two bucks or three, five bucks on per click on, on Google search 
You can be spending six, eight, twelve dollars on LinkedIn, depending on who you're going after and where you want to show up in their feed. If you know that people aren't spending 20 minutes scrolling through their feed on LinkedIn, then you want to show up near the top. And I've got videos on my YouTube channel talking about LinkedIn advertising in depth and how to optimize it and how to go after those people. So definitely check those out. But you want to obviously stay at the top as people are searching and coming through. And a lot of times people are like, I'm just going to spend three bucks a click, four bucks a click. Well, you're way at the bottom. They'd have to scroll for like five minutes to see your ad. It's just not worth it. Now you only get paid if they click, which is good. It's not, it's not if they just see it, you only get paid if they click. Um, but that is the most strategic and targeted way to say these people at these companies with this job function in this geographic region, when they come on LinkedIn, they're going to see this ad. You can't beat it. We manage multiple campaigns for our clients. Now they do perform the best, but they are the most expensive. So on LinkedIn campaigns, you're going to be looking at spending a minimum of $1,500 to $2,000 a month just to get your feet wet and get started and then optimize it from there. Spend maybe three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000 a month could be good for you if you're selling a high dollar product or a high dollar service. Um, but that's really where, in my opinion, the most strategic PPC campaigns are going to be focusing on Google strategically and specifically, and then also, or in place of doing things on LinkedIn with the display promoted things, not the text on the side, Inmails do work. Uh, we do email campaigns for some of our clients. They do work. They're cheaper than a lot of a lot of systems out there because uh, you're looking at like a dollar to maybe a dollar and twenty cents per send. Um, but if you can only focus on Google and LinkedIn, that's going to be the best bet. If you don't have a team to do it for you, reach out to us at MFG Tribe. Go to our website. You can chat with Greta, and we can set up a discovery call. If you're like, I'm already on Google, but I don't understand LinkedIn, we can get you set up with it very quickly, very easily, um, and manage your campaigns and do all the creative behind it. So that's it for the bulk of this content. So recapping it up, we're talking about uh, just advertising for manufacturing companies, focusing away from the common ways of trade shows, publications, and just doing blind Google searches. Really be strategic. Focus on your organic search and your organic stuff on social. And then if you are going to go into a specific campaign, then Google search at a minimum dollar amount, starting off with less than a thousand. And possibly if you have a higher budget than that, looking at some LinkedIn advertising campaigns, those are going to be the best methods for you to go forward into 22. All right, guys, we're back. Let's go through these comments. I went for, I, w I went for 45 minutes talking. That's a lot. So I need, a, I need a break from it. All right, Riley, hit us with some of these comments. All right. So we actually had a comment before the live even started. Um, this was at 9 a.m. So they were in early. Uh, Chris Carrington asked, what automated tool are you using for LinkedIn? Oh, Chris, you got to sign up for that webinar we're having next week if you want that. I will send you an invite to it. I can't share all the secrets, man. You got to sign up for that webinar and I will give it all away and I'll even show you how to use it. Cool. And then we also have a couple people. Carl Albert wants to learn how to do lives, thinks it's a great idea. Um, Tim Callahan wants to learn to do some lives as well. So maybe that's something we can do separate. Okay. Could be interesting. All right, we can do that. Um, Tim Drinkwater asks, he's got a few questions actually. He asks, how far out are you scheduling and planning your lives? Great question, Tim. Uh, fortunately for me, I've got a team here that does it. But uh, what we did was we created a spreadsheet of topics. We used AI, ChatGPT. Hey, here's, here's a subject, create some topics that would create engaging content, et cetera, et cetera, for social media lives. Came back with this big, long list. We pasted that into a Google Sheet. The team sent me the Google Sheet and said, Kyle, vote on these. What you like, what don't you like? I went through it. ChatGPT gets you so far. What I ended up doing was changing, slightly changing the words a little bit to something that I actually want to speak about. And what I did was I booked out probably six weeks, eight weeks of lives, uh, just in about 10 minutes of going through that list. Um, and then from there, like we're coming up on it. These, this topic has been, was picked back in January. I think we're booked through March. And so at some point in the next week, this week, maybe my team's going to be like, you need to do it like today or tomorrow. Uh, I need to pick another eight, 10, as many topics as I can, four, six, eight, just plan it out. That way we can schedule the live. Our graphics team can schedule the graphic. 
we can talk about topics, like all that stuff. So usually, but how I used to do it was like the week before. I'd be like, what do you want? They'd be like, what do you want to do next week's live? Uh, let me think. I want to do this. And I would just spitball it. Got another one from Mr. Tim. Is one live a month enough to gain traction? Yes. I think that one live a month is enough to gain traction. Uh, what you need to do is focus a lot of attention. If you're doing just one, focus as much attention as you can on promoting that. So maybe you say, like, what are we at? We're at March 12th right now. You say April 23rd. I'm going to do a live talking about this. Um, push it out there now. Promote people to it. Promote, promote, promote. While you're promoting, you're generating your content. Maybe you want to do like a screen share. Maybe you want to go through a presentation or something. Maybe you want to do a shop floor tour. I don't know. Like bring your camera out onto the shop floor, Tim. Uh, show, show some people some stuff. Um, talk about coding efficiencies or when you're talking about tool paths, you know, selecting the right tools, et cetera. But yeah, I would say um, a month is plenty of time if, if you have the time to do it. All right, so this is back when we were talking about ways to get leads. Kenneth Kusima said articles as a way. Yep, yeah, so good job, Kenneth. So articles are a way. Here's the thing with articles is, so you've already got attention and traffic going to your website, right? So it does not matter if you've got 100 people a month or 1,000 people a month. People are going to your site. Are they the right people? Unless you've been around for years and you've got a good following. But let's just say you've got... 100 people a month that are going to it. And 20 of those people are the right people. You want to look at the top landed on page and you want to look at the top visited pages in Google Analytics and look at that page. If that's the first thing that they see on the page, then you want to make sure that there's call to actions in there and that you have put your article somewhere linked in there. People think that, oh, and they're going to come to my site, they're going to go to the blog, they're going to go to the resources, they're going to go to that page, they're going to read this article that I just posted. That does not happen. Use a pop-up on your website, depending on what your site's built on, WordPress, Magento, like doesn't matter. Use some sort of pop-up that can pop up, bottom right-hand corner, bottom left-hand corner, middle of the screen. Hey, check out this new article we wrote because you got to bring attention to it. With articles, you can email them, you can post them on social. You're waiting for Google to index them and crawl them. That's going to take a couple months to see some results from that. So you have to force the traffic to it. We've already got people on your site, throw a pop-up saying, check out the last five tips of this or three ways to do that. Have it as a pop-up, have it embedded in the pages that are most visited, which for, for almost everybody, 50% of their traffic or more is their land is their home page is their top most visited and landed on page. Have a section that just says, check out this article that we just created. Cool. And we got a question from Ryan Weber. He has thoughts on using lead generation built into a CRM lead generation built into a CRM. So depends on what you're talking about, Ryan. So if you could provide some more specifics. So it depends on the CRM and it depends on what you're using for lead generation, but it's got to be some sort of tool. So if you have a specific example of what that uh, lead generation tool is that's built into the CRM, then I can answer it a little bit more directly. All right. And then Mr. Tim has another question. Um, he asks, what type of postal should you use? Flyers, trifolds, handwritten notes, or a business card? Yeah, so I think the best thing with flyers is if you can create a postcard, like let's go, I would ease into it. So start small, create a postcard, four by six, whatever weird, weird size that the printing company is going to have. Put a QR code, maybe with a giveaway, but a QR code on there and have that QR code go to a specific landing page that's only for that postal traffic. That would be ideal, right? I get a postcard, big section, QR code visit here to learn this or whatever the giveaway is, whatever the promotion is, whatever you want people to do. Check us out. We're the leading in CNC machining with a QR code. People scan it. Ideally, you don't want them to go to just your homepage. You want them to go to a landing page. So it's your domain forward slash uh, whatever the URL is, word dash, word dash, you know, vertical bar for forward slash. And you want to make it to where that's not a page, ideally, because we do this for customers all the time. Ideally, that's not a page that people can just go to, right? That's not some, something that's part of your menu structure because you want to be able to look at the traffic going to that and say, this is how many people landed on this page. And they, I know that they only came from a QR code. So if you're like, I've got my 
CNC machining services page, just clone that page and put a, instead of dash clone, which is what happened by default from any program, put dash uh, 2024, dash Q2, Q1, dash postal, something like that. Something that can differentiate it. So that way you can look at traffic just to that page. Now you could go down the path of saying like, oh, but if they if they do this QR code, it's got a UTM tracker on it, and I know that it's going to go to the postal campaign of X, Y, and Z. Yes, that works. You could do that too, and just send it to any page on your site. But sometimes that stuff breaks, and it doesn't really show through the best on Google. To, I know Google Analytics is like awesome, but sometimes it it messes up too, and you won't be able to see the exact traffic to that URL. Um, but don't get caught up in the in the uh, creative behind it. In an ideal state, it would be like old school, standout, handwritten letter in an envelope. You wrote it yourself. I just want to reach out and thank you for being a LinkedIn connection or just want to reach out personally and let you know about our services. That would be ideal, ideal, but that's not really scalable. So for things like that, you want to keep that type of stuff to specific companies or specific people. Um, but I think just a normal four by six postal is a good way to start. So Ryan, who had the question earlier about using lead generation built into a CRM, came back and said that they use Odoo. I don't know Odoo, so I don't. I don't. I, I don't Odoo. Uh, I don't know. It depends on what you mean by lead generation. Like the whole phrase lead generation is like you're going to do something to get people's eyes and attention on something, and then from there you're going to have to reach out to them, right? You send traffic to the website, then you could have some retargeting ads, retargeting traffic to the website. And if they don't click, you bring them back into the funnel, send them another email, do some other sort of thing. Um, so you have to tell me specifically what are they doing with lead gen that they call, we'll generate leads. Uh, you have to tell me specifically what it is because I haven't heard of that one before. Ryan's like sitting there like typing now, like I'm going to get it. Yeah, we may give him a second to see if he uh, comes up with anything. Got back to us. Ryan got back to us quick. Um, he said, basically, you pay for a list of people that meet a certain criteria. Okay. So I would not call that lead generation, Mr. Weber. Because uh, lead generation, that's is that going to generate leads? you got to do something with that information. So that's like list building. Um, so what was the original question? Do I like it? Yeah, thoughts on using so thoughts on using that. So I, we use Seamless AI and we use Zoom, Zoom Info. That's what we use. I don't use any other tools. I don't use any other third parties. I don't use people that are like list building services. They're like, hey, we'll give it to you for a penny a contact. We'll build a list for you. I don't like that because I don't trust what they're searching, right? So I want to have complete control. I want to do a search and look at the results. I want to see, is this the right fit? Yes, it is. Let's go and export the contacts, backfill it with the person's contact information. That's kind of step one. Step two, from an automation standpoint, some of the things that we do here in this office with automation would probably blow most of your guys' minds as far as like, do we have to click and go into something and select it and bulk export and then download it and import it and do all that stuff? We used to, we don't anymore because we built automation for it. So things like trade shows, right? There's NPE, IME West, Fabtech. There's all these trade shows, D2P shows, all this stuff, right? Exhibitor lists are out there. And it's like, okay, I'm going to pay somebody. Like we did, I did this last year. I'm going to pay somebody in the Philippines or I'm going to pay somebody in India two, three, four, five bucks an hour. And they're going to farm a list for me. They're going to go to this association. They're going to go to this thing. They're going to build a list by copying, pasting into a spreadsheet. <clears throat> and then from there, they're going to go and find people's contact information through the web. I used to pay that like a decent amount of money a month. I mean, I'm talking probably like over a thousand bucks a month to build these lists for us to market to. And you're probably thinking like, Kyle, you spend so much with Zoom Info, just use bulk credits. Yeah. If I don't have to use the credits that I paid for, I prefer not to to use them for other things. Uh, now that's all automated. We built some code, we have some connections, we use some tools that we have subscriptions to. Two clicks, bam, list is pulled, pulled into Seamless AI or Zoom Info. Those contact people are then grabbed, all their information, then seamlessly imported into HubSpot, 
from HubSpot, it gets put on a list. From that list, it goes into a sequence. From that sequence, stuff gets sent out. That is all automated now. So I like to be in control because I don't trust other people's lists. So if you can build your own list in there and get the contact information, yeah, 100% use it. The quality, the, the accuracy of it, that's up, to, that's up to you to decide by testing it. Send an email, see how many bounces you get, no responses, they no longer work here. Look at the person's contact information, their name, look them up on LinkedIn, do they still even work there? That's going to come down to an accuracy standpoint. But if you think that company-wise it's good, like it's you're getting good information, then it could be worth it, right? I would have to look at the tool to see. Um, but if you look at reviews, everybody's going to be like, oh my God, it's the best. I use two, Seamless AI and Zoom Info. That is it. Uh, I know that there's hundreds of other tools. Lucia is good. Um, but Lucia is limited, right? Lucia, you spend 50 bucks a month. It's a little sidebar thing. Go on LinkedIn, find somebody, click it in Lucia, pull up their contact information. But for 50 bucks a month, you get 50 contacts. Well, I'm hungry. 50 contacts is not going to do anything for me. Like I want 5,000 a month. I want 7,000 a month. I want to go after everybody. I look at my goal. My vision is to be the largest and most dangerously aggressive and best industrial sales and marketing agency in the world. Not in Texas, not in the Midwest, not in the Southeast, not in the United States, in the world. I want to be known as the biggest and the best and the legendary company. In order to do that, I need to touch a lot of people. And 50 contacts a month isn't going to get me there. So Lucia is good. Hunter.io is good. Apollo people use. Lots of different tools. Um, but it's what you do with the information after it that actually matters. If you're a content marketer, don't make anything else until after you watch this video. Today we're going to be talking about what most content marketers get wrong. And so if you're a content marketer, we, we produce a ton of content, right? Like for our clients and for ourselves on my brand, the company brand, and all of our clients' brands in the industrial space. So we've got a lot of data to support why we do things the way we do it. We also see and get back end access into a lot of client side stuff where other people have worked on it. We get to see some mistakes that were made and whatnot. So we're all about helping people, educating them, giving you some tools that you can use literally today in every piece of content we, we produce. The goal is, can I provide value to you today? All right, so the first thing is the purpose. So what content marketers typically get wrong is starting with the purpose. What is the purpose behind why you're creating that piece of content? And oftentimes people, are doing it for the wrong reasons. They're doing it to get something in return. So I get it from a company standpoint. You have to create a piece of content because ideally you want somebody to see it, increase your brand, and then that turns into revenue. But don't solely do it for that reason. Go into it from a standpoint of, I'm trying to educate somebody. I'm trying to help somebody out with something. So I'm creating this piece of content to provide them value first, and I'm not gonna ask for anything in return. If something in return comes from it, that would be an ideal state, right? You help somebody out, you educated them, you taught them something, you entertain them for a period of time, and maybe in return, they subscribe to your content, maybe they go to your website, buy a piece of your equipment, use your services. That is a great end goal, but if that's the only reason why you're doing it, then you're putting the vibe out there that it's somewhat one-sided, and I can promise you that you will see less return. It'll be a diminishing return on if that's your sole goal. Here at MFG Tribe and on my personal brand, we produce so much content to help people. If something comes back from that and it ends up being a client or somebody sees something and I said something to help them and they end up being a client of ours in some capacity down the road, then great. But we're not doing it strictly for that reason. But I can tell you that if you go into it from the standpoint of, I just want to provide value to you first before I could even ask for anything in return, ask for your attention, ask for you to share it with somebody that you know, I wanna provide value first, then you will see a massive return on that investment. Just putting that out there, you will get results from it. So starting with the purpose, diving in deeper of it, what is the purpose of that specific video? So you're going at it from a standpoint of, I want to educate, entertain, or help somebody with something. Then it's like, what is, what is the ultimate goal of that? Like breaking down that video or that article into different sections of saying, in the end of this, I want them to do this thing. I want them to know this one thing. And then making sure that the structure and the way you have it laid out is going to achieve that. You can't just throw up information on a piece of paper. You can't just throw up information in a video. You have to have some sort of structure to it to where it's easily digestible. 
somebody can get some value from it, they can follow along and you're keeping their attention. So if you go at it from that standpoint, I promise you that you will see better results. The next point is gonna be the volume of the content. This is where everybody in this specific space gets it completely wrong. Volume of content is going to dictate how much value you can provide, how much return you can get on that investment of making that piece of content, and then result into whatever ROI that you're seeking. Too often people think that if I post one time a week on LinkedIn, or if I create one video a month, then they look at the results of that one piece of content, or maybe it's five, and they're judging the results based on that and saying this doesn't work, this method, this strategy doesn't work, then it's a false sense of saying that it doesn't work because you have not given it the amount of volume that you need to to get it to work, right? So great strategy, great idea, but the execution is where it failed. You have to be creating a significant amount of volume. And the main reason for this is that everybody that you're trying to produce content for is very busy. And if they're very busy, there's a lot of distractions. And if there's distractions, that's basically noise. Does not matter the platform, does not matter if it's the phone, email, social media, YouTube. There's a lot of things going at them from the standpoint of watch me, read this. And then you've got the advertising side of it where people are like, no, pay attention to the right side of the banner. No, pay attention to this non-skippable ad. All of that's going on in their face, so you have to make sure that you're producing enough content that you can break through that. So specifically on LinkedIn, when we were posting one time a day for, I don't know, the past year and a half, I was getting X amount of impressions on my content. It was around like 20, 25,000 impressions a month on my content on my personal profile. At the end of last year, I said, let's just do a test and let's post three times a day. And the team was like, damn, that's a lot of content. And it is a lot of content. Well, let's just test it out and see the results. After 28 days, we're at, I don't know, 50, 60,000 impressions a month, more engagement, more people messaging me, more people saying, dude, that helped me, voting on our polls, whatever it is, right? And I said, let's keep it going and see how high we can take this. We now have it up to right around 100,000 impressions a month on my personal profile of the content I produce. Now, that may not seem a lot to like a, a lot of bigger brands that have more followers that are getting more engagement, that would probably be true. But going from 20 to 100 in 30 to 60 days is pretty massive. And the only variable that we change is the quantity of posts per day. Now, you may be thinking, dude, three posts a day is ridiculous. I work for a business. I can't possibly be doing that. Yeah, that may be true. Do you have an assistant? Do you have a team that also works there that can post stuff? I mean, if we're talking company page, you can post multiple times a day because if you think about it, not everybody's gonna see it. When you log into LinkedIn, you're gonna see whatever is trending or popular at that point in time. Maybe one of your connections that you follow and engage with just posted something that shows up on your feed. But if I posted something yesterday and you happen to come in LinkedIn at 10 o'clock today or 11 o'clock today, and I haven't done my post for the day yet, and then you're off of LinkedIn within 20, 30 minutes, there's a high likelihood you aren't going to see the post I did yesterday, and if you don't come back for two days, you're not gonna see the post that I did today. So it's from a timing standpoint that if you're pushing out enough content at various times of the day, various frequencies of the week, there's a higher likelihood that you will capture that person on that specific platform when you're trying to get their attention. It's different on each platform, but everybody will tell you that more content will not hurt you unless it's your pocketbook and you're paying somebody else to do it, but you will see an ROI to make that justified spend, to spend the resources and the time and have your team do that, but it's all about volume. There are people that will say, post less frequently, you'll get more engagement on that post, 100% true. If I only post one time a week, and I had a massive following that was just like dying for my content, then that single post would get a lot of engagement. But what I'm basically doing is instead of doing one post with a lot of engagement, I'm gonna do a lot of posts with smaller amounts of engagement, but it's more content, it's gonna provide more value. So I go back to the purpose, if my purpose is provide as much education value as possible, then I need to produce as much content as possible. Our team needs to grow, we need to do different types of videos, different types of posts, ask for polls, engage with people, whatever it is, but you have to drastically increase the quantity and the volume of your content. The third one's gonna be consistency. So you've got your purpose down, you're producing a lot of content, but are you doing it consistently? The algorithms like people that are consistent. Your market's gonna like people that are consistent. If you go into it and say, I'm gonna post twice a week, three times, five times a week for the next three weeks, and then you stop, 
You basically told the algorithm, I don't care about this anymore. The people that you're marketing to are gonna be less likely to stay engaged with it if you're not posting on any regular basis. And hopefully if you have enough of a following, people will start messaging you saying like, hey, where are you guys at? I haven't seen a post. We used to go live two to three times a week consistently. Then we changed our content planning strategy going into 2023 where it was still the same quantity of video but less live inter interaction because of everything that we have going on here at the agency and the growth that we've seen over the last 12 to 24 months to where it just wasn't feasible for us to keep that type of schedule. So we still produce the same amount of content, just not in a live format. We reduce the frequency of live formats. So we're spreading out all the attention that we were getting, small amounts of attention on multiple videos into hopefully the goal is more attention when I do go live, but we have had numerous people message the comments on YouTube saying, hey, when are you guys gonna go live again? Because I have not seen you in a couple of weeks. So it's typically twice a month. And then we have some other team members that are doing their own live shows. Think about it from the standpoint of, if you're not consistent, then you're not going to be able to see the long-term play and the long-term results of the action that you're taking with video. Video is not an instant gratification thing. You can post a video today that you create or an article today that gets immediate engagement and get some gratification for you to hopefully fuel you to produce more in the future. But if you want to look at it from standpoint of, I'm trying to push my brand out there, my company brand, at a massive amount of scale and we're the underdog and there's bigger companies for us and you have to look at it from a long-term play standpoint. That is where people fall off. No different than in sales, the money is made in the follow-up because most people do the sale, quote somebody, and then they forget to follow up past the immediate responses, that is where the money's made, no different than with video and creating content. You have to be consistent with every single week or every single day for a long period of time. If you look at anybody that's popped off on YouTube, all of the content creators out there across the world, they were producing videos for years, every single week, every single month before one of their videos took off and then their channel grew. No different than videos for an industrial manufacturing company you produce one video, typically people would say, I'm gonna make one video, four minutes long, company overview, it's gonna go on my homepage, go on my about us page, and that's all we're gonna do for a year. You will get so few views and engagement on that single piece of content because people don't see it on the platforms you're posting on or they don't watch the whole thing. You have to be short with your content, try different things. So create a long video or create a long article and then break it up into little micro content pieces to be able to make it easily digestible to people, but you're not gonna be able to do that if you're just producing one thing a month or one thing a quarter. You have to develop a consistent pattern to where your volume's increasing and you're doing it consistently over time and then test and measure after you've given it some runway to breathe, like 60, 90 days, look at the results and then make adjustments from there. Last one's gonna be the distribution platforms. Where are you putting this content? Whether you're writing content or creating videos, where are you going to put it? It all has to live somewhere, but you have to think about it from the standpoint of where is the lowest valued attention? Where can you get attention from people the cheapest? Where are people spending their time? It can go on your website if it's a video, it can go on your website if it's an article, but if your demographic's on LinkedIn, you need to be posting on LinkedIn, but in a format that is friendly for that. So you can post a link to your article on LinkedIn company page, right? And it's gonna take them away from LinkedIn but LinkedIn doesn't typically like that. They want people to stay in a platform, no different than any other social platform, they want you to stay in it. So you could take an article and break it up into little snippets, post that as opposed to the company page, and say, check out our website to see the full article. So you're trying to trap the engagement, stop people from reading further, right? You're trying to stop the scroll, get them to see what you wrote, read a, a little snippet of it and say, yes, I do want to click it. Or you can say, the link is in the first comment, right? You can make a comment, put the link there so that way you're kind of playing with the algorithm from a LinkedIn standpoint. No different than on video, if you post a video to, a, if you post a link to a YouTube video, you would think that people would click it to watch the whole thing, but most of the time they don't and LinkedIn doesn't really push it that hard. So changing that to native uploaded content that's in vertical format, not square, that is posting regularly every day or a couple times a week, you're gonna see more engagement. If the, the type of video that you post in there is 30 to 60 seconds, then you can play on the short attention span and give people small, easily digestible pieces of content. That can go on LinkedIn, upload as a native post, and that can go up to YouTube Shorts because YouTube's promoting Shorts a lot so far this year because they're trying to compete with TikTok. You can take that to TikTok if you're a personal brand. You would wanna also put the long-form content in video. You'd wanna put 
the long form content link embedded onto your website, multiple different pages. You can create a video library on your website, no different than a blog, but just for videos, where you list out in tiles all of the different long form videos. You can have a section on the right hand side of your website where you're putting in some short content feeds. You can have every single page of your website where you're talking about a service or a product needs to have its own video. If you're talking about a product, have a video about that product, not just 3D rendering, animation, exploded views. I'm talking about explaining the value proposition, interviewing with clients, all of that, those strategies are built into one single video so somebody can click it. And then maybe as you go out throughout the page, there's little short videos that you create, but you have to look at it and say, I can't just put it in one location because I'm capturing an audience that goes to that location. But if I want to drive people to where the final video is, like let's say it's YouTube or your website, then you have to pull them from different resources. You have to send it out through email marketing. You can send it out through email marketing, then pick up the phone and call these people. Hey, we sent you a video that I thought you might get some value out of. Check it out. Let me know. You know, Share it with your team. Put, post it up on LinkedIn. Twitter, I still would not pay attention to. Facebook and Instagram, unless you got a big following there, which most industrial companies don't, that's not going to really provide a lot of value for you. But you have to distribute it to all the platforms, possibly slightly tweak it to that platform specifications. I feel like LinkedIn native upload versus YouTube upload on shorts can be the exact same video. It's just a different platform. Using the proper hashtag within that environment, if it's on social or YouTube, is important because that's how you're gonna get discovered. That's how people are gonna find it. That's gonna help the algorithm tell you what you're trying to, like the, the demographic that you're trying to go after. So you have to slightly customize the post to each platform, but I feel like there is some cross-pollination of this video can go on LinkedIn, this video can also go on YouTube Shorts, the long video can go on YouTube, it can also go on the website. The short video, maybe you create a different, shorter version of the video that goes on your website. Maybe you upload natively a, a wide format video on LinkedIn. You have to test out your specific demographic and then based on that data, make adjustments to your strategy all the time, like every single month. We're constantly testing things here where we will change a thumbnail on a YouTube video, all of a sudden we get more views change the way we're captioning it, change the cuts that we use, the styles, the lighting, the scenery, who's in the video. We test this stuff all the time to figure out what's the best method. And it's no different than what we do with our clients. We produce a video, but then we change up the format and see how are people engaging, like what are they get engaging most on LinkedIn? Is it an article? Is it a, brand, a graphic with like an infographic or just a regular graphic linked back to the website? Or is it a video? And then looking at videos, is it a short video, a long video, is it a client testimonial, is it an explainer video, is it a link to a video where it was a webinar? All those things have to be tested, you look back at the data, and then once you figure out your ecosystem of what's working for you the best right now, double down on those different areas and see where can you have that, that bell curve of performance fall off. So once you reach there and you reach that plateau of like, yeah, we're, it worked, we're getting more people from these different channels, these things are working, how do we want to make it better? And you can make adjustments even further from there to really raise the ceiling on it. As always, guys, I appreciate your time. Go over to YouTube, subscribe to the channel, turn on notifications. We are posting videos every single day. We are growing our team. Right before this meeting, we we're interviewing more people to produce even more videos. So that's what it's all about is providing as much value to you guys as possible. Hopefully you got something out of this. Share it with someone that you know. If you wanna to listen to this in podcast format, go over to technical sales and marketing on every podcast platform, play that, lock your phone, and go cut that grass and jam out to me teaching you something while you are multitasking. We will see you on the next one. If you're on the fence about making content, in this video I interview Jordan Yates. She jumped right in and she is crushing it. She is a marketing engineer by day and she has been taking on the content creation role on LinkedIn, going towards being an influencer and we're gonna dive into this conversation. So Jordan, tell me about your, what is it that you do? I work full time as a marketing engineer for a ceramic capacitor manufacturer. And in doing that, it's mostly behind the scenes research. I am basically the power electronics expert, as they call me. 
And I mean, keep the term expert relative. <laughs> so um, I started there about a year ago and I'll do things like research the applications for where our products will go because they're very specialty. They're not just like jelly bean parts that can go in anything because they're more expensive and more high reliability. So I basically look at schematics 90% of the time and then do market research, overlap all that. And then I tell the team, hey, this is where our product should go. And then I'll train the salespeople on it. And that's important because our salespeople are not engineers. So this stuff isn't something they would just already know. But to be fair, it's not something regular engineers already know without like spending the time to look at it. So basically the internal resource for that. Then I have my own flip side of it. Yeah. So that's my engineering side. And then on the side of my, I guess, side hustle, if you will, I don't feel like it's full fledged enough to call it a business. I would still consider it a hustle. I have started a company. I'm calling it Jordan Yates marketing just because I have a big presence on LinkedIn and Jordan Yates is what was recognizable. So I, I had a different name that I used for my LLC at first, but it wasn't like it didn't, it, it didn't ring any bells and I didn't want to grow that name because I wasn't necessarily trying to make a large business. I just more so enjoy making content. So what it is, is I'll create like what I tag as fun and relatable technical content where a uh, customer I have like right now is laying reels for an offshore wind farm and they want me to showcase their capabilities. So I'll take what I know about the technical side and then try to make it more digestible for a non-technical audience, but also targeting the technical people they'd want to sell their services to. So mostly content creation videos, posting their content on my LinkedIn, things like that. But also occasionally I'll help them set up LinkedIn, do some LinkedIn training and things Very of that cool. nature. So your, your content creation journey, talk to me about the setting it up, mm -hmm. where you're at, where you went from where you first started, because it's a, it's a pretty like large thing to just jump into, right? When yeah. you don't have a team to support you or things like that. So talk to me about when you first got started and where you're at today. Yeah, so, gosh, it's been probably like a year and a half now. I was a technical sales engineer for a, I guess you'd consider industrial automation and controls company. They were a distributor and an integrator. And they didn't have super good name recognition. So when I was cold calling, I was realizing like nobody knew who Jordan from XYZ company was. Yeah. And it was really frustrating because I'm like, nobody knows who we are, but you think that we're like the most, you know, awesome company in the area. Everybody knows us. There was a disconnect. And I'm like, how do I pitch everything we do in 30 seconds? Because typically if someone answers the phone, they already decided they don't want to talk to you. They're kind of like, oh crap, like it's a salesperson. Yeah. So I thought, how do I make it to where my cold calls turn into warm calls? So I started growing my LinkedIn and I would post pictures with like demos. And then I slowly got into videos and I would just like connect with the people that I wanted to sell to and then other industry professionals and especially our suppliers because they would see me making content and then send me more demos because they're like, this is awesome. Well, that got me a lot of traction and made it super easy to get appointments, got into a lot of tier one accounts that way. And then for a multitude of reasons, I decided to quit that job. But at that point, my people on LinkedIn were like, hey, like we love your videos. Why did they stop? Where did they go? Like, what are you doing? And I was like, uh, I don't have these demos anymore. What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to talk about? So I started getting into like soldering. So I was like, this is manufacturing related. This is a fun technical thing. And then I had people start reaching out to me being like, can you make videos for our company? Like, this is cool. I want this for my company. Can you do this? And I'm like, yeah, 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 I can do that. Like, why not? You're close enough. This isn't too hard. And so I incorporated an LLC and I did that around the time I left my other company, but they were crazy about their non-compete. So I just dropped it for a year. I didn't touch it. I, I stepped away from LinkedIn for a while until I started feeling like, okay, they're probably not going to come after me if I start making content. Like I'll just, yeah. like, it's okay. So like back in, I guess, November, I started back into content again. And then I was like, you know, what would be a fun extension, a podcast. So I, 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 I love listening to podcasts and I thought this would be a cool way to have industry professionals on, but not be one of those 
manufacturing specific podcasts where like if my mom listened to it, she can enjoy it. But also if a young engineer listens to it, maybe they'll get career advice. So it wasn't as drilled down. It was more the people side of all my technical stuff. So that's where I am now and getting some customers and getting rolling and finally becoming, you know, I guess, uh, what do they say? Post revenue yeah. <laughs> or, or what, whatever it is when you're not a zero dollar company yeah. anymore. <laughs> yeah. Profitable. Yeah. Like you're essentially starting like a one, one girl agency to do it while you have a full time job. Yes. Do you think that you would ever say, you know what? This is all I want to do. Like, do you love it that much already? Do you mm -hmm. think, can you see yourself loving it that much? Or you know, I get asked true? that a lot and people are always like, oh wait, can I ask you that? Like on a podcast, like, what are you going to say? Like, I don't want to get you in trouble. But the, the truth is I love what I do for a living. And I feel like to be an engineer making content in this industry, I'm too early in my career to stop being an engineer in this yeah. industry. I love my job. I love the people I work for, which I've never, loved a job before like i genuinely enjoy what i do and i work remote so i have a lot of free time and flexibility in my schedule so i enjoy having the reliability of it but also i don't feel ready to step into content only because i don't think i have enough industry experience to justify that i feel more connected with what i'm doing given that during the day i am still an engineer and i haven't gone full content yet so I, I just, I don't see that happening anytime soon, probably in the next five years. Like I want to keep doing what I'm doing, learning, get more deep in the engineering before I, I consider switching to anything else. Yeah. I think it's interesting you doing that, getting more experience. Cause I feel like people these days, regardless of age, are mm -hmm. like, as soon as they can do their own thing, they're like, yeah, I quit my job. I'm doing my own thing and I'm going to make so much money. And they're talking about things that they don't really have experience doing and mm -hmm. they haven't really worked a lot. Yeah. And they're just all of a sudden like, yeah, it, it's almost like 20 year old life coaches. Yeah. Right? Or like relationship advice from a 22 year old. Mm -hmm. like, I feel like it's, it's smart for you to go down that path because you can get more experience doing whatever it is that you want to do. And then decide like, okay, now I'm at this point. I want like, I've done enough things that I know that this is a passion of mine. Yeah. I didn't just come and go. And it's something that I want to invest into. So I feel like that's more of a an answer coming from someone in your space yeah. versus like, and honestly, like whether they're 20 or 50, I feel like the new trend is like, I'm going to be my own boss. Maybe it's because yeah. of COVID, but. I don't know. I just, I really like my boss right now. So yeah. I don't want to be my own boss yet. Like I learned so much with the people on my team currently. And I love like having the network in my current company like I don't want to give that up like I learn a lot from those guys we have really great engineers I work with and for me I, I am an engineer and I want to stay one for a while like I, I know there's always like you start as an engineer and then you go to management and you do something else and engineers don't always stay engineers but I really love doing engineering and especially the kind I do and so I, I don't I don't know I also think I would get burned out if I did this full time because I have to be on when I'm recording I'm an introvert. I like to be alone for extensive amount of hours a day. Like I love that and I need that. Yeah. So I couldn't do this all day, every day. That's just not a fit for me. That's not my personality. I feel like I show up best in a place like this when I get to be alone for the first six hours of the day. Yeah. So that's why like, unless something flips inside me, which I don't think it will, I think I have to have the technical roots to ground me. And then this is how I express myself on top of it. Yeah, I mean that's a that's great for being that self aware. Yeah, I feel, like most, I feel like most people aren't. They're just like, yeah, I'm gonna do it. And then before you know it, they're like, oh, I should have done that. Yeah, and you get resent resentment, regrets, things like that. What's one thing that you wish that you have right now to help you out in your journey? Um, Besides, like a dope team, like what we have, a trust fund. Yeah. <laughs> No, I mean, I'm to the point right now where if I had, you know, better equipment, that would be cool. If I had a better camera or, you know, better editing software, or if I maybe took some time to like learn or take a course, like that would be awesome. But a big part of what I talk about on my podcast is just learning as you go. It's okay to fail. It's okay to not have super high quality instantly. And that's kind of part of my brand is learning as I go. So yeah, sure, it'd be nice if I just had $3,000 to go buy a nice MacBook, but the fact that I'm on my way to earning it and that when I do get it, it's going to feel really satisfying knowing that I earned it with this extra money from making videos. So if I have anything, maybe, I don't know, an extra few hours in the day, yeah, <laughs> like, that would be cool, but unrealistic. And I feel like you learn, like your content's going to be 
more well perceived as people see you progress. Yes. Right? Starting with like, not saying that the videos were ghetto, but like my first videos five, six years ago were pretty ghetto. Yeah. Right? And so you're starting off further further along than I did because of technology these mm -hmm. days with the phone. But seeing the progression to where you get more polished, more polished, different types of things going on, I feel like people would like to be part of that journey. Yeah. Versus you being like, okay guys, so I'm going all in and I'm spending five thousand dollars on a month to, for, on a team to produce this for me. Yeah. It's like walking people through that journey because then you can speak to the struggles, right? Yes. And that's a whole, and that's all about what your podcast is, is like failing for people, mm -hmm. you can, you're like the resident expert. Right? <laughs> yeah, and I like the idea of like, you can do it too. And it's like, especially if companies don't have the budget or you're just an individual, it's like, okay, well look what I did for less than $200. Look what I did, this is how I spent no money on these steps of it. Like, if you don't have the budget but you think you need to be in a digital space, like you can learn from me and what I've done and I'll tell you what worked for me, what didn't, and I like, I like having learned the hard way in that sense. Sure, there's some things that can make my life easier, and at some point, I hope that I can find those, but it's just like, like you said, it's it's nice to learn as I go, but sometimes, you know, I just get a little tired, and I'm just like, I wish this could be a little bit easier. Yeah. What are three goals that you have this year? Hmm. Personal or professional? Well, okay, so one that's a silly one is I I hate the overlay that I use on my podcast. So I try to incorporate the colors from my podcast cover to the overlay I use for episodes. And if you go through all my YouTube ones, because I started episode one, I did YouTube and audio, right? Well, the first like four episodes have different overlays because I was experimenting and so there's not much like... I don't know, consistency there. And then finally I picked one and I'm like sticking with it. But like, I still don't like it. So I think one goal is to eventually make that better. And I don't know if I need to do that now so there's consistency in the future. So you mean like the thumbnail of the episode? No, or but like when you're talking. When I'm talking in the episode. Okay, so, so like the lower thirds? Yeah. Like the text on the screen type yeah, of stuff? Yeah, that okay. stuff. So like, and I guess I don't technically have to have it, but when I was doing solo episodes, I was like, it should probably have something so people don't think I'm just like talking for, you know, 40 minutes with absolutely no context. So I right. thought that was good for branding, but figuring things out like that. Yeah. And then my website, also pretty bad. I need to work on that. It, it's a little nitty gritty things like that that I just don't enjoy a whole lot, um, but I'm working on. So set aside time for that. And then, I don't know, get some cool, higher paying customers would be awesome. I like the ones I worked with, but I would definitely like to keep expanding and growing and have a consistent stream of business with my side business. Because so far I haven't really marketed it yet. I've just been getting you know requests organically. So I'd like to continue that and hopefully build a stream there, which I guess these were all very focused on my business, but I have a million other goals, but that we could go on forever. Yeah. So you know, I mean, that's good that you at least have them um, top of mind. Right? Yeah. That's why that's why I asked that question just to understand the mindset you're in and what what you need immediately. Okay, so we can help you create a new overlay. We, you're gonna make we. your team do it. Yes. That would be cool. Um, I feel like I'm on like a Oprah show right now. We'll give you an overlay. Yeah. We'll give you this. Yeah. <laughs> My overlay's bad. Yeah. I'm sure it's not as bad. Do you find yourself like fighting for perfection? Because I've talked about that a lot and we've had some comments on YouTube where people are like, well, yeah, that's good. Don't be shooting for perfection in the beginning, but you need to get there. Do you ever find um, yourself struggling or are you just not? I'm not a perfectionist, but I do, I, I am able to recognize when something's bad and needs improvement and a reasonable amount of improvement. And that's like the overlay I know. When it comes to making videos for my customers, I do feel a lot more pressure for it to be perfect. And so I'll send them like first drafts and I won't spend too much time on the first draft just to like get a feel for what I actually should be improving and what speaks to them rather than just like me obsessing over transitions and whatnot. So I'll say what looks good, what doesn't. And then I'll take that feedback and think, okay, this is what I need to like perfect or improve on rather than thinking everything has to be perfect before the first draft. So first drafts are what I, I emphasize quite a bit. And then I work on, I guess, perfecting, but in my personal stuff, eh, not so much. Yeah, I know I'll get better with time, but I, I don't obsess over perfection. Yeah, I feel like that could be a hindrance with people. And when it comes to the first draft, like we do this internally where we don't know, a lot of times we'll ask the clients, 
what are you looking for? What do you like, don't like? And they'll be like, well, I don't know. I'll know when I see it. And yeah. so if you spend too much time on that Rev 1, mm -hmm. then you show it to them, they're like, oh my God, I love it. Or, oh my God, I hate it. Change yeah. all this stuff. You're just wasting time, right? So exactly. it's like getting to the point where you're able to show somebody something to get constructive feedback so they can tell you what they like and don't like mm -hmm. and then working Rev 2 or Rev 3 if you have to go there yeah. to be closer to it and get that approval. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people in our industry mm -hmm. on LinkedIn, they're like, oh my God, I gotta make a video. Yeah. And then they do like 17 takes and they're like, I still don't love it. Part of it's nerves, part of it's like, they want it to be perfect. Even Nancy this morning made like, she was making a raw, I think she did it like six times. Yeah. And that's just because she's only made maybe five or six videos, but eventually she's just gonna be like, well, that's good enough, just throw it up. Yeah, exactly, because like, unless I'm making it for like some epic project that's like really gonna be showcased, if it's just another podcast or just another episode or just another of your like daily content, it's like, it's gonna get lost in the feed. It's gonna be there and it's just gonna be another thing. You just need to show up more consistently and it's okay if they're not all perfect because what people recognize is that you're there. And so that's why I prioritize consistency over perfection because if I try to perfect it, then I'm never gonna release anything and I'm gonna become irrelevant really quickly. Yeah. So that's why I'm like, just do the best you can. But if it is for a customer and someone's paying you for it, then that's when you need to like really hone in on the details. But if it's for just me, my personal brand is like, you know, best I can. And I, I like that we can see the improvement as I go. Cause some things, end up coming more naturally, like figuring out lighting or things like that. And once I fix that, then it just, it, it, it makes it a lot better. But that's the nice thing about editing. Like it doesn't have to be perfect the first time you can go fix it later. It's good that you're able to recognize that, but then it's just you, right? So it's like, you can make the adjustment. You're not like in front of a room of 50 people, like you're not getting embarrassed at all, which you shouldn't anyways. Yeah. Like, and that's the most... thing. It's, it's so hard to embarrass me. And like, I know that I like mess up and it's fine. Like I just own it. But it, I think it's funny too. Like I was doing an interview style uh, video for the customer the other day and a few times I'm like, Oh crap. I forgot what I was saying. Let's restart. And he thought it was funny. And I was like, yeah, I messed up too. Yeah. Like, and so whenever he would mess up, he'd be like, Ooh, wait, can we like, uh, you know, reel that back? Like, can you edit them? Like, yeah. Like, and then we'll say, okay, see, let's keep going. Yeah. And then, so it's like not that much pressure. And I feel like if you are nervous in front of the camera, the best thing you could do is be in an interview style because then you can get lost in the conversation. You forget yeah. cameras are there. Cause if I was focused on like this camera, this camera, this camera, then I would be like, Oh, that's not my angle. Let me adjust. Yeah. Like, let me look perfect. But it, it's more about the authenticity and just chilling out yeah. and people will relate to you a little bit more yeah. than being stiff and reading from a script. Yeah. Scripts. I feel like the first time that I shot a video and it was just me and I'm staring at that lens, like eventually I got used to it to where I just get lost in it to where now when we film, I can just stare at a lens and I don't need to stare at somebody. It's definitely weird when you're doing it alone. Cause that's yeah. how I started kind of like you, but it was just me filming it. I didn't have a team and I would edit it remotely. I had somebody that was editing it, but it was just me filming it originally six years ago. And yeah, I was like, wait, does this look good? And I have to record a little bit, go back and play it and watch it and look mm -hmm. at it to where if it is more of a conversation based, it's like we're documenting it with these cameras. Yeah. Pay no attention to them. Yeah. Like we're just filming and in the end it's going to be a great, you know, it's going to come off way more natural. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm sure. What's one mistake you feel like people are making in our industry with creating content? Not doing it. Okay. That's what, it. what is, um, <laughs> that's your mistake. If you're not doing it, start doing it. Yeah. What is, and use these guys. They're really good. <laughs> but if you want it to be relatable, AKA lower quality, hit me up. <laughs> yeah. What's something that like, so we were talking earlier about people that produce content mm -hmm. with on the surface, it looks good, but there's no depth to it. Mm -hmm. And how like, would you would, you would agree that you would rather have, less vanity numbers of engagement, but quality over quantity, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, just because I know, like we were joking around, like in this industry, it's really easy to like put a pretty girl in front of the camera and you're like, oh, all well, these engineers will like, they'll be so excited, they'll wanna watch it. But if you're going to do that and try to do the whole like angle of using someone attractive, then 
make sure they know what they're talking about because they feel like you can hook them with that. You can get them to click on it, but how do you make them stay? Yeah. You have to have like meaningful things and like actual interesting technical concepts that you get into that are relatable to them. But also if they're just a paid actress or just somebody you're like, oh, you're the pretty person on the team comes in from the camera. If they don't understand it, I feel like it's a lot less engaging. It's a lot less natural. And the people who do know that content, they're going to be able to notice and they won't respect it. So I feel like either get someone who is technical and teach them to be good in front of the camera or train your guys that are good in front of the camera really well to where they can speak technical but understand it. I don't know what's easier. I really don't. Yeah, I feel like if you have a base level like aptitude for technical things, mm -hmm. like just in general, if people use a term, you're like, oh my God, I couldn't even know what that means. But if you could just remotely understand some technical subjects mm -hmm. and are good in front of the camera, can, can hook people in with your words, mm -hmm. I feel like you can learn the technical stuff yeah. faster at the surface level. Yeah. Right, because I always tell people technical sales is eighty percent selling, twenty percent technical. You don't yeah. have to know everything. You have a team for that, mm -hmm. but it's hard to find somebody that is technical and outgoing and captivate an audience and keep some can keep somebody engaged. Yeah, um, but I think the key, like, is how are you going to hook people, right? And that's what a lot of people in our industry are doing is they're hooking them with something, an image, a video, but not keeping them. Yeah. And at the end of the day, they're not selling them anything or providing any value. So it's like kind of entertainment. Yeah. But I feel like those people are getting that dopamine drip of like, oh my God, I got 1,200 likes in an hour. Like, yeah. cool. But if I'm their boss, I'm like, does it actually do anything? Translates to sales dollars. Or anything like yeah. brand awareness, sponsorship deals, sales dollars. Like, yeah. No, like, do, can then, you like, teach someone something in that video? Like, what are they getting out of it other than like, looking at someone pretty because like go on instagram you know like yeah. you can do that there and it's like i, I don't know a technical concept is a, or technical content is a weird concept in that regard because like if you are someone who's in sales and like you said you don't need to fully understand it as long as you're not presenting yourself as an expert right. and saying you know i i know all these things and i'm i'm the expert here and i'm talking about it like be honest, you know, like, hey, I'm a sales guy. Like, I've gotten to learn this stuff recently. I'm new to it. I'm excited about it. I think it's cool. I want to tell you about it rather than presenting yourself as an expert when you're not. So I think it's just to like, be honest with where you're coming from and then people will respect that more. Absolutely. Any closing points about people out there in our industry from a content standpoint? What's your, what's your one piece of advice? You can do it yourself. Absolutely. But if doing it yourself has become too overwhelming and you can't get out of your head, you can always pay someone to get you started or you can pay someone and have them do it all the time. But you'll feel more empowered if you just get started. So rather it's taking the leap of faith with yourself or contracting someone out, get the ball rolling and learn as you go. And eventually you'll get the hang of it and you'll be a natural. All right. Well, guys, that's it with Jordan Yates coming in. You better check her out on LinkedIn, follow her, send her a connection request, and engage with all of her content. Thanks, guys, and thank you, Kyle. You're welcome.